Hey everyone, if you're interested in the Bible, you probably know that there are a lot of key words and terms, and usually the word until is not one of those terms that gets a lot of attention. But in our message right now, we are going to be exploring what we call eschatological untils in the New Testament that have implications for future events. Now, when we're talking about the word eschatological, we're basically talking about eschatology or things concerning the future. So we're going to be looking at the word until in the New Testament that has significance for future events. Now, let's dive into this topic a little bit more. I note here on this document, which we will be using as a guide, that the New Testament employs the term until in various contexts, some of which are eschatological, involving future events, and among these eschatological until some even signify a reversal of present circumstances. So those are the ones that we're going to focus in on. There are uses of until in the New Testament that are not eschatological, and then there are some that are eschatological, but they don't necessarily indicate a reversal of circumstances. But we're going to focus on about 10 occasions where the word until indicates a significant shift in the Bible's narrative and storyline. So what we're going to do now is in this document, we're going to delve into 10 examples where until in the New Testament reveals a transformative shift in the biblical narrative, offering a transition from one state of affairs to another. They also reveal that significant events and circumstances must occur beyond the time period of the New Testament writings. So when we look at these 10 examples, I think they're interesting in and of themselves individually, but then collectively, they really come together to show significant future prophetic events that still need to occur. And I really think if we understand these eschatological untils, it will go a long way in helping us understand the Bible storyline and future events. Now, as we go through these 10 examples of eschatological untils with a reversal of present circumstances, we're mostly just noting them. E each of these examples that we're giving, we could probably spend a half hour to an hour on. They are that significant. Now, the first one we want to begin with is Matthew chapter 23, verse 39. And this will deal with the issue of Israel's coming salvation. One thing you should note is as we go through these 10 examples, I will note the verse. And then we'll mention briefly what it's about. And then there we will summarize the point being made with the verse. And then sometimes, because it's important to understand what comes before and after these verses, I might give a little bit of the broader context. But this is the format that we will be using. So when it comes to Matthew 23, 39, I'm going to jump to the broader context here. And I have verse 39 highlighted in bold. But we see a very important eschatological until with reversal in mind here. Now, in Matthew 23, Jesus is rebuking the Jewish religious leaders for their unbelief and for other things. And then he addresses uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in verse 37, which is representing really the people of Israel and their leaders as a whole. Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. So Israel's problem is unbelief in Jesus as Messiah. Now, there are consequences for that in verse 38. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And we believe that that is a prediction of the coming AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So that's what Jesus means by your house is being left to you desolate. So national unbelief is met with a national catastrophe that will occur in about 40 years from the time Jesus is speaking. But then in verse 39, we will see that this coming desolation or destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is not the final word for Israel. Something that is negative will be then met with something that is positive in the future. So Jesus goes on to say, for I say to you, from now on, you will not see me, which indicates that his presence as Israel's Messiah is going to be taken away from the people of Israel. But then we get the important word here, until... And then this is going to indicate a reversal until you say, until Israel says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that comes from the happy Psalm of Psalm 118, which talks about Israel's positive uh, reception of the Messiah. So Jesus is predicting a negative circumstance, the destruction of the city and the temple, that's your house being left to you desolate, and his presence being hidden from the nation, from the people of Israel. But it's until you say. 
and we believe this until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is a positive declaration from Israel concerning Jesus, which involves Israel's uh, salvation and calling out to Jesus in faith. And when that occurs, that will end up being a reversal of his presence being hidden from Israel and probably also a reversal of Israel's house being left to you desolate. When Israel did not believe in Jesus, Jesus' presence became hidden from them. He personally was removed from them. The city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. But when Israel believes again in the future, those three situations will be reversed. The Messiah will return to Israel in salvation, and Jerusalem and the temple will be restored. And just to read the point that I have here uh, with this verse, Messiah's hidden presence from Israel will be replaced by his presence among them again when Israel embraces Jesus as Messiah. Since Jesus mentioned Israel's house being left desolate in verse 38, this reversal of circumstances could have implications for the temple and for the city of Jerusalem. Now let's move on to Luke 13, 35, which is very similar to Matthew 23, 39. So we won't spend as much time on it. It is coming in a different context within the gospel of Luke, but notice how similar this is. Jesus says to Israel, behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So we have really the same sort of situation here. The house is being left to you desolate. That involves temple and city of Jerusalem. And Jesus' presence will be hidden. You will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is another text, this time in Luke's gospel, where uh, Israel's unbelief and the consequences of that with implications for the temple and the city of Jerusalem, that those situations will be reversed when Israel cries out to Jesus in salvation. So, so far we've, we've seen two of the eschatological untils with implications for national Israel from a negative situation to a coming future situation. And because Israel is still in unbelief as a whole, as a nation, we still believe that, that day is coming when Israel will cry out to Jesus in salvation with the uh, blessings uh, that will come with that. Now, in the next examples here, in Matthew 26, 29, and the ones we'll see in Luke 22, uh, you have a situation where the Passover is the stimulus for the, the Last Supper. As Jesus does the Passover, which you know leads to the Lord's Supper, uh, he's obviously physically present with the disciples. Now, this is a very sober scene, but he is physically present with them during a meal. So there's intimacy and fellowship and those kinds of things. So it's going to happen with these next three eschatological untils we're going to look at. As Jesus will mention that, hey, we are together at a meal, but then he's going to be going away. We know why, because of the cross and the ascension. But Jesus predicts that in the future, really in connection with his second coming in kingdom, there will be table fellowship and celebration and eating and drinking again in the kingdom of God. So in Matthew 26, 29, this involves Jesus's coming personal bodily fellowship with his disciples. So, and then he says here, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So there's going to be a gap of time between this last supper that's taking place and then the kingdom. But when the kingdom does arrive, there will be the resumption of drinking the fruit of the vine. So fellowship, personal intimacy connected with table fellowship and those things will be restored. So the point here is in the coming kingdom, Jesus will once again drink the fruit of the vine in fellowship with his disciples. The Passover celebration will not be Jesus's final meal with his disciples. And then you see similar things with Luke 22, verses 16 and 18. Luke 22, 16, Jesus says, for I say to you, I shall never again eat it eat this meal that he's having with them until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So you have this last supper and the celebration of the Passover and then a gap of time and then the kingdom of God that comes with Jesus's return. And when he comes again with the kingdom, there will be the resumption of table fellowship. And by the way, uh, we're not going to go to Isaiah 25, but if you were to study Isaiah 25, that passage does talk about that after a period of uh, tribulation upon the earth, and then the Lord coming again to Jerusalem. That's discussed in chapter 24. Chapter 25 talks about kingdom banquet fellowship that involves the real eating of uh, food. So there's food and drink uh, in Messiah's kingdom. 
So in the coming kingdom, Jesus will once again fellowship and eat in celebration with his disciples. And we see very similar in Luke 22, 18, concerning the fruit of the vine. Jesus says, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So again, very similar to verse 16. So there will be both eating and drinking in actual physical approximation with, with bodies. In this case will be resurrection bodies. There's going to be real tangible eating and drinking amongst Jesus and his followers when the kingdom of God is established. And again, uh, like the others that we've seen, we believe that this coming kingdom celebration with banquet is still future and awaits the second coming of Jesus. Now we come to another very important one in Luke 21, verse 24. This is very important for the restoration of Israel and Jerusalem. Now in Luke 21, verses 20 to 24, Jesus is describing details of the coming AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem. Now I'm just going to focus on verse 24 because Jesus is talking about this destruction that will come in AD 70 and then the aftermath. So this says, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. So Jerusalem, people of Israel, not only is there destruction with AD 70, but there's captivity into all the nations. So there's a negative aftermath. We're also told that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. And again, he's going to link this with the times of the Gentiles. So we'll just go ahead and read this here. That all We're told that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Jesus is predicting a continuing of the times of the Gentiles, which actually began with the 586 B.C., Babylonian captivity. And the times of the Gentiles would be times where Israel is not really in control of Jerusalem and the temple because of Gentile powers. So because of Israel's unbelief and the consequences of the 80-70 destruction, the times of the Gentiles are going, to, are going to be extended. And we're told that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. So again, very negative situation for the people of Israel. But then you get the very important eschatological until, until which indicates a time period is going to occur, but there's going to be a reversal until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And once the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, the heavy implication here is that there will be a reversal of the negative situation uh, that Israel had been in. In connection with Luke 21, 24, I was looking at Ellicott's commentary as he made statements on the statement, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Ellicott says this, the thought expressed in this clause that the punishment of Israel and the desolation of Jerusalem were to have a limit, that there was one day to be a restoration of both is noticeable as agreeing with the whole line of St. Paul's thoughts in Romans 9 to 11 and being in all probability the germ of which those thoughts are the development in Romans 11, 25, which we will be getting to shortly till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We have a distinct echo of the words until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled or literally better the seasons uh, of the Gentiles. But I think it's interesting here that Ellicott is talking about, you know, the punishment of Israel that's associated with uh, 8070 and the desolation of Jerusalem. But he noticed that there was, that this has a limit and that there was one day to be a restoration of both. So we see heavy implications coming from the eschatological until in Luke 21, 24, that the negative situation for Israel and for Jerusalem and for the temple is going to be reversed when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So to summarize the point we're making concerning Luke 21, 24 and the eschatological until that we see here, Israel's captivity to the nations and Jerusalem's trampling by the Gentiles, i.e. the times of the Gentiles, will be reversed with the restoration of Israel and the capital city of Jerusalem when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, which we would still see as being a future event. Another significant eschatological until with reversal can be seen in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Now, this is one where we do need to read what comes before verse 21 to help us uh, understand this use of until. So I'm going to pick up with verse 19, where Peter is speaking to the men of Israel in the heart of Jerusalem. So this is Acts 3, 19 to 21. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until, that's where we get our the word until, the until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Now, according to Acts chapter 1, Jesus had ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. 
Now, with that having happened, telling Israel to repent and return, to get saved in order that they may have forgiveness of sins. Your sins may be wiped away. And then there are kingdom implications that will come as a result of that, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So those would be kingdom blessings coming from the presence of the Lord, who in this context would be sent to Israel, because verse 20 says, and that he, God, may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. So that's a prediction of the second coming of Jesus. And we're also told that Jesus, who is now in heaven, but is destined for a return, we're told that whom heaven must must receive. So heaven had to receive Jesus for a while. I mean, that's uh, linked with Daniel uh, 7, uh, verses 9 to 14, also Psalm uh, 110, 1, which talks about a session of the Messiah at the right hand of God until he begins to rule the nations on earth. So we're told that heaven must receive Jesus, notice, until the period of the restoration of all things, which was predicted by uh, the holy prophets from ancient times. Notice the mention here, until the period of the restoration of all things. We believe that is the kingdom of the Messiah and the restoration of everything that comes with Jesus's kingdom when he returns. So this is linked with the sending of Jesus the Christ. So when Jesus is sent, there's going to be a period of restoration of all things. The earth will be restored. Nature will be restored. The animal kingdom will be restored. Read uh, Romans 8, 19 to 22, talks about even the inanimate creation being restored. Isaiah 11, 6 to 9 is a messianic passage. It talks about the animal kingdom being restored. Jesus, when he comes again, is going to restore everything. He's going to rule the nations. There's going to be justice. There's going to be righteousness. We might also want to note, too, that this word for restoration in Acts 3.21 is linked with the word in Acts 1, 6, when the apostles asked Jesus, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And so the restoration of all things would also involve the restoration of national Israel. We also believe that all nations, all geopolitical entities will be blessed at that time as well. But what we are saying here when we look at this very significant use of until in Acts 3.21, Israel's Messiah, Jesus, is currently in heaven. But when Israel believes in Jesus, when they repent and return and have the wiping away of their sins, what are we told? God will send Jesus to Israel, and Jesus will restore everything as the Old Testament prophets predicted. So we're seeing, again here, another significant text concerning the future salvation and restoration of Israel. Israel currently in unbelief. There's going to come a day when they do believe, and there's going to be blessings for them, which in this context are called the restoration of all things. And that brings us to Romans 11.25 and another significant until. So what we have here in Romans 11.25, and I'm actually going to go to the broader context here because we, I think we need to mention Romans 11.26. In Romans 11, Paul has been making the argument that God has not rejected his people, has he? He's talking about Israel currently in unbelief. And then in Romans 11, 1 to 10, he talks about the importance of the remnant of Israel, believing Israelites that act somewhat as a preservative for God's plans to save the whole entire nation. Now, in Romans 11, 25 to 26, we're told this, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. So what is significant here is we're told that there is a partial hardening that has happened to Israel. And because of the word until, it's a temporary partial hardening. Now, it's been clear all throughout Romans 9 through 11 that Israel as a whole is in unbelief. There are certain Israelites who have believed, they're the remnant, but Israel as a whole has not believed. So there has been a partial hardening, and the reason why it's partial is because there, there's the remnant. There's believing ethnic Israelites who have believed. But Israel as a whole is in unbelief. But notice that this situation of a partial hardening to Israel is until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So God's plan for saving and blessing Gentiles in this age, when that comes to fullness, when it comes to completion, God, everything God planned for the Gentiles in this particular age, which involves a lot, read Romans 11, 12, and verse 15. It talks about great blessings that have come to the world with Jesus's first coming before his second coming. But when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, notice what happens. And so all Israel will be saved. 
So the Israel that's currently in unbelief as a whole is going to tr transition to an all Israel that is saved, the majority of the nation, people and leaders. So there's a transition going from uh, Israel's temporary partial hardening to a salvation of the nation as a whole. And then Paul ends up quoting Isaiah 59, 20 to 21, which talks about national Israel repenting from their sins and the Messiah being sent to them and uh, Israel being incorporated as a nation into the new covenant. And so when we look at the point of Romans eleven twenty five, 25, with this eschatological until the point is this, the current partial hardening of Israel in which the majority of the nation is an unbelievable transition to a salvation of all Israel. Moving on, another eschatological until has to deal with the issue of the Antichrist. In, in this context of 2 Thessalonians 2, he's referred to as a man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. So in 2 Thessalonians 2, and I'm going to read what comes before this just so we get the whole context here, including verse 8. So I'm going broader context here than just verse 7. Paul says, and again, what Paul's doing here in 2 Thessalonians 2 is he's telling the Thessalonians who were wrongly led to believe that they were in the day of the Lord, that they're not in the day of the Lord. He'll say, the reason you're not in the day of the Lord is because the apostasy and the revealing of the man of lawlessness haven't occurred yet. Those are future events. Paul appeals to futurism, things that have not happened yet, but will in the future. And he talks about events associated with the day of the Lord, events that we believe are still even future from our standpoint right now. Paul says in this text, and you know what restrains him now. Well, who's the him? The man of lawlessness of verse three, so that in his time he will be revealed. So Paul's talking about a coming revealing of the man of lawlessness, who's the Antichrist. And then in verse seven, he says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So there is lawlessness occurring in this age, even though we don't have the man of lawlessness, but only he who now restrains. So there is a restrainer who stops or hinders the man of lawlessness from popping up on the scene. So there's this restrainer, or only he who now restrains will do so, notice, until, eschatological until here, until he is taken out of the way. So the restrainer is currently restraining the man of lawlessness from coming on the scene. So you have a situation where there's no man of lawlessness but when the restrainer, who is probably the Holy Spirit, and again, I understand there's debate on that. There may be some of you out there who have a different view of the restrainer. I think the restrainer is re referring to the Holy Spirit. I think he's the only one powerful enough to hold back Satan's man, the man of lawlessness. But when under God's timetable and according to his plans, that restraint is removed, then the man of lawlessness comes on the scene. This is until he is taken out of the way, and then verse 8, then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Notice that uh, the lawless one eventually will be revealed. So there's a situation where the lawless one is not on the scene, although he probably wants to be, and then the restrainer removes that restraining influence, and then the lawless one, there's a reversal. All of a sudden, the lawless one comes on the scene. So that's another case of eschatological until, and to uh, summarize the point, Lawlessness is currently at work, but a restrainer has hindered the coming man of lawlessness, but the man of lawlessness will be revealed when the restrainer removes his restraining ministry. And then the last example we're going to look at actually deals with the events after Jesus' coming millennial kingdom after his second coming. So according to Revelation 19, Jesus comes again. Revelation 20, there's a thousand-year millennial kingdom reign of Jesus and the saints upon the earth. And then Revelation 20 verse 3 is going to talk about that Satan will be incarcerated and imprisoned as a person with no access to the earth at the beginning of and throughout Jesus's millennial kingdom, but then there will be a reversal. So we're told that there's this angel who threw him, Satan, into the abyss. The abyss is a spirit prison for spirit beings where they don't have access to the earth. So Satan is thrown into the abyss, and notice that the angel shut it and sealed it over him, and that, that indicates, again, an incarceration of a person. And as a result, Satan will what? So that he would not deceive the nations any longer. So during the millennial kingdom, Satan does not have access to the earth at all. And as a result, he can't deceive the nations during this time. But notice that's until, so eschatological until here, until the thousand years were completed. And after these things, he must be released for a short time. So if you read Revelation 20, Satan is let out of the abyss for a very short time he tries to lead a rebellion against God, and it's instantly met with fire judgment and sentencing to the lake of fire. But it is true here that he has no presence whatsoever on the earth during the millennium, 
But then when that thousand years are completed, he's really, he must be released for a short time. So there's a reversal. There's a situation where you do not have Satan having any access to the earth and all of a sudden he has access again. So there's a reversal of situations. But of course, we understand the sins and judgment. So the point here is Satan who has been incarcerated in prison will be released for a short time to deceive people on the earth. Now let's look a little bit here at the implications of these eschatological entails. I think when we put this together, we're, we we see some really important things here. First of all, several of these eschatological untils with reversal concern the salvation and restoration of Israel and end of Gentile domination over Jerusalem. Now, the ones that really hit that point are Matthew 23, 39, where Jesus says his presence will be hidden from the people of Israel until they cry out to him in salvation. And then also the same thing with Luke 13, 35, uh, when you come to Luke 21, 24, you actually see a reversal of the trampling of Jerusalem and Israel's being captive to the nations. There's going to come times where the gen times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and, and then Jerusalem and Israel are restored. And also Acts 3, 21 indicates that once Jesus is sent again, there's a period of restoration, which includes the restoration of national Israel and everything uh, at that point. And then Romans eleven twenty five. It indicates that uh, Israel's current partial hardening will be reversed with a salvation of the nation as a whole. So those are pretty significant ones concerning national Israel. So when I think of the eschatological untils, it indicates a reversal of negative uh, circumstances for the nation of Israel. And it also goes to show that AD 70, as horrible as an event and significant as it is, it's not the last word in the prophetic plan. With Jesus' coming in kingdom, there actually ends up being a salvation and restoration of Israel. And then I think we should also note that you, we did have several that indicate personal fellowship that will occur in the coming kingdom of God as a result of Jesus's return. So in Matthew 26, 29, Luke 22, 16, and then Luke 22, 18, there's discussion of personal banquet, celebration, presence, fellowship that was occurring when Jesus was on earth with his disciples and will occur again with the coming kingdom of God. And then we did see, you know, you know one of the eschatological untils in reference to uh, the, the coming of the Antichrist and then the situation concerning Satan after the end of the millennium. And then a second point that we want to make here is that these cases point to significant future fulfillment of God's purposes. These include the restoration of national Israel and Jerusalem. They also foretell a time after this present age when Jesus's followers will enjoy celebrations, including food and drink in the kingdom of God. Now, we totally grasp the great significance of Jesus's first coming. There's a lot of eschatology fulfilled with Jesus's first coming, mostly in regard to his suffering servant role, and then the beginning of the church, the Messianic community of believing Jews and Gentiles. But there are some significant events that still need to occur. So in some, several eschatological untils in the New Testament unveil a profound progression in history, when present predicaments are destined to be reversed upon the fulfillment of future eschatological events, these reversals usually involve the return of Jesus with subsequent blessings for Israel and Jesus's followers. These examples not only offer insights into biblical prophecy, but also inspire contemplation on the transformative power of God's ultimate plans for the restoration of all things. So I just encourage you to go through these uh, 10 again, these eschatological untils with reversal. They really help us understand the Bible storyline and the significance of important events uh, that are still to come. So anyway, I hope this uh, study was helpful. Again, remember to uh, check out uh, my website at michaeljvlock.com and see what sorts of books and video courses that we have going on. And we'll see you later.